take a moment to pray together this morning. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come together to worship. Lord, we're thankful for the fellowship that we share as a body of believers, um, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we're thankful for the many people who serve, both in this local church and, um, and those who are um, serving here in the States and around, uh, around the world as our missionaries, Lord. We pray um, for Dave and Sandy Fetter and Bill and Cheryl Neely, for Pavel and Heather Nikolai, for Jeff and Lucy Williams and Mary Sorensen, Lord. We pray that you'll continue to bless their ministries and provide for their needs and help us as a church to be faithful to encourage and support them in the, the work that you've entrusted to them to do. And Lord, we ask for your help. Um, for those who couldn't be here today, um, for those who are sick, that you minister healing and strength to their bodies. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving that you'd give comfort and encouragement to them as well. Lord, we pray for the moms who are expecting babies. We pray that you'd keep both moms and babies healthy and strong. Um, Lord, we ask now that as we study your word together, that you'd help us to see the things that you want us to see in your word and apply these truths in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's one question that probably just about every kid has asked, at least at some point in their life, perhaps many times. It's the question, how come my mom knows everything I do without anyone telling her? <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? Yeah, I came across a discussion on that online here this week, and there were a few moms that provided their answers. One mom said, I never told my kids I had carefully placed mirrors around so I could watch without moving to the door. <laughs> Another mom said, remember, your mom has watched over you since you were born. She is an expert on you. She knows how you'll usually react. One said, when babies are young, we need to be tuned in to distress sounds. I can tell you that no matter how old my kids get, coughing or crying noises are like a lightning bolt to the brain. No matter how quiet you think you are, mom probably heard that tiny creak in the stairs. Our brains automatically screen out common house noises and go on red alert for anything else. And then finally, a mom said, of course someone is telling her, just look in the mirror. You tell your parents everything without saying a word, especially without saying a word. That's usually when you're speaking the loudest. You have a trail of your, you leave a trail of your activities everywhere you go. My boys left remnants of their activities in their pockets or on the floor of their rooms. In other words, there's always evidence. That's why moms always seem to know everything that you do without anyone telling her. Because you're leaving evidence that's there, and she cares enough to actually look for it. But let me ask you a different question this morning. What evidence is there that someone is a follower of Jesus? How can you tell if God is working in your life? Is it noticeable? And so that's the question that we're going to be talking about this morning as we continue our series in the Gospel of Luke. We'll be in Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 14 this morning, continuing our series entitled, Introducing Jesus. And we'll be talking about the subject of the mark of a prepared heart. The mark of a prepared heart. You see, last week we were looking at the ministry of John the Baptist and how he was preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And we saw how John had a mission or a ministry of proclamation and preparation and that he was preparing people's hearts through a message that he proclaimed of repentance for the forgiveness of sins so that people would return into a right relationship with God. So that having returned into a right relationship with God, they would be ready, ready for the coming of Christ and ready for the judgment that he would bring. And we saw last week that in many ways, John's mission is similar to our own because we too have a mission of proclamation and preparation that we might be prepared and that we might prepare others for the coming of Christ and the judgment that he will bring. And so if the mission is to prepare hearts, then how do we know if our heart is prepared? And that was an issue that John was dealing with in his ministry as well. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, is the mark of a prepared, uh, prepared heart. We'll be in Luke 3, beginning in verse 7. 
He, referring to John, said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. So as we look at these verses this morning, you know, we're going to be talking about the subject of the mark of a prepared heart. And we're going to look at a problem, and then we're going to consider the solution, and then finish with an application for our lives today. And the problem in John's day, which is much the same in our own, is that some professors are unprepared. Some professors are unprepared. Now, I'm talking about professors here. I'm not talking about college professors, teachers in a university or something like that. I'm talking about professors in the sense of those who profess to, in John's case, have repented, or in our day, those who profess to be Christians or followers of Jesus. And, the, and the, what we see there in verses 7 through 9, an issue that John was dealing with in his ministry, is that some professors were unprepared. They were professors professing to have repented before their baptism, but their, profess, their profession wasn't the real thing. It didn't give, um, it wasn't in line with reality. And so we see, beginning there in verse 7, that John's baptism was being misapplied. John's baptism was being misapplied. The reason I say that is because of the language that John uses there. In contrast to Matthew, who was rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees, um, Luke talks about John addressing the crowds who actually came out to be baptized by him. So the implication is that John had a similar message for, for, with different people for different reasons at different times. And so here, he's actually addressing the crowds who came out to be baptized, and he calls them a brood of vipers. He calls them snakes. Um, and and, and asked in, in rebuke, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Saying you're like snakes who are fleeing from under your rocks because there's a fire in the desert and you're heading down to the, to the river for safety. And he's saying, and that's not a flattering image, is it? To be compare, compared to a snake, especially when you look at biblically, snakes were generally associated with things like Satan and evil and going back to the time of the fall in the garden. And so, and so this is certainly a rebuke suggesting that there is something wrong with these people who are coming out to be baptized by John. And as we look at verses 8 through 14, we get the, the idea that people were seeking baptism, but they weren't really repenting. People sought baptism without truly repenting. There wasn't really any life change. They were saying that they were repenting, but there wasn't any evidence in their life to back it up. You know, it's, it's not all that uncommon today in our own culture. We'll see um, people that are supporting all kinds of causes verbally or through in different ways. So you may see that people are wearing um, rubber um, bracelets or they're wearing ribbons or they may even dump a bucket of ice water over their heads. And that's all fine and good. They're supporting causes that I'm sure some of them are very, you know, bought into and very sincere and they know precisely what they're doing but at the same time there's a lot of other folks who are doing the same things because they're just going along with the crowd right and so they may be totally ignorant of the cause that they that they're supporting they're just kind of going along with it and that seems to be the case of what was going on in John's day is that people were just kind of going along with the crowd maybe they were afraid because of the message that John was proclaiming about judgment maybe they were just um, going along with the crowd because everybody seemed to be getting baptized. I don't know. Maybe it was fear. Maybe it was a fad. But one way or the other, they were just going through the motions. They weren't really 
doing anything to evidence that their lives had changed, that they had truly repented. And when it comes to, to different causes and things today, that it doesn't really matter that much if you, if you know the ins and outs of the cause that you support, perhaps, with your bracelet or your ribbon or your bucket of ice water. But, but when it comes to, to John's message or the message of the gospel, it's supremely important because people's eternity is at stake. And so people sought baptism without truly repenting. And in John's situation, um, the reason they weren't repenting is because people still placed too much confidence in their heritage. So as if John is saying there in verse 8, don't even begin to think that, well, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, don't even think about the idea that, hey, I'm covered because, you know, I'm a blood descendant of Abraham. And, and God made promises to Abraham to bless him and his descendants. I'm one of his blood descendants. Therefore, I've got it covered in this whole relationship with God thing. And John is saying, no, the, God could actually raise up children for Abraham out of stones on the ground. Now, what's the point that John is making there? And we can gain insight from that, from the, on that from Paul's teaching, which he went to on several occasions, in one instance in Galatians 3, 7 through 9, to help us understand um, who are the real children of Abraham that are under this covenant blessing that God had given to him. We see this in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 7. Now then, that it is, uh, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. And so it wasn't just the blood descendants of Abraham who would be the recipients of God's eternal blessings, but it was those who followed in, in Abraham's faith, who recognized their sinfulness and trusted in the provision that God had made or was making or would make for the, the, um, the forgiveness of their sins. And so that, that's the emphasis that Paul made over and over again. And I think that's the idea that, that John is saying here is that it's not that it's that it is God who makes you God's people. It's not your family or anyone else. And God responds to repentance and faith. And so that's the, I think the, the emphasis that John has here is that people still placed too much confidence in their heritage. I'm thinking that just because they were a descendant of Abraham, they were covered as God's covenant people. And he's saying, no, God could raise up, it's God who makes God's people. He could make his people out of rocks on the ground if he wanted to. But God is a, is a God who responds to repentance and faith. And so in John's day, since people were placing too much confidence in their heritage, they weren't truly repenting. They weren't taking their sins seriously. They weren't coming back and recommitting to that right relationship with God, to walk with him as their Lord. And so as a result, people were exposed to God's wrath. And that's the image there in verse 9. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Trees. Every tree, therefore, that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's an image of eternal judgment. And, and what John is saying here is that you guys are still exposed to the wrath of God, not because you haven't been dipped in water, but because you haven't truly repented. You haven't truly repented. You're still going your own way and doing your own thing. And so, so John's baptism was being misapplied. And so he, he issued a very scathing rebuke, a, a warning to the crowds who were coming out to be baptized, perhaps just out of fear or because of a fad. But he was issuing this scathing rebuke and warning to say, look, you guys actually need to be responding to the message here, not just getting dipped in the river, but you actually need to, 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 to be taking this message of repentance seriously. Because if you're not, you're still exposed to God's wrath. And you know that we face some of the, the the same issues in our culture and even in our churches today, that many professing Christians have a misplaced confidence. Many professing Christians have misplaced confidence. You see, just as then, so now, people still trust in a heritage or a pedigree more than Jesus. And so you might be thinking this morning, well, I was born and raised in a Christian home. That's a wonderful thing. That's a good thing. I've 
been going to church all my life. I hardly ever miss. That's great. Going to church is a really valuable thing to do, a good thing to do. Um, yeah, I, I prayed a prayer when I was a kid, or I got baptized at some point, and I even have my little certificate. Those are wonderful things. Praying those prayers and getting baptized is a good thing to do. The problem is, is that those things in and of themselves, while they may be good things, that's not what salvation is really about. And so if you're placing your confidence in your upbringing, your religious activities, some prayer that you recited after someone that you may not even really know what you were doing at the time, if that's where you're placing your confidence, then you're in a similar boat as the crowds who were coming out to John to be baptized. Because, uh, and as a result, you may have a, a false sense of security from God's wrath. And that's the case for all too many people in churches today, is that people have a false sense of security from God's wrath because they don't understand that salvation is not about what you are doing for God, so to speak, in terms of your religious activities, but that um, salvation is all about what God has done for you through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so perhaps you've never come to terms, uh, you've been going through the motions, you've been doing all of these things for various reasons, whatever they may be, but you've never really come to terms with the fact that, as we talked about last week, that there is a God who has authority over the way you live your life, and that you have a sin problem, that, that you have sinned against God and accrued a penalty, an eternal death penalty on account of your sin, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And, and, and so on account of that, you recognize that you need to trust in Jesus as your Savior. Why? Because he is the Son of God, and that he died on the cross to bear the penalty for your sin, and on the third day, he rose again for you. And maybe you've never really come to terms with that in your life. You've just been going through the motions, if you will, thinking that your religious activities are good enough to cover you because of the family you were raised in or the things that you do, and you've never really come to terms with the fact that, that, that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus alone is the one who can save. And if that's the case, then just like in John's day, so now you, you are dangerously exposed to the wrath of God on account of your sin. And that wrath is just as imminent today as it was then. You see, in, in, in verse 9, John, John is talking about the axe is laid to the root of the trees. It's an imminent image that, that the axe is going to come down. And, and, and even today, we can look forward to the second coming of Christ, and we don't know when that day is going to be. Perhaps it will be today, maybe tomorrow, maybe it will be 500 years from now. We don't really know, but it's imminent. And so we don't know how many more opportunities we're going to have. And at some point, when Christ returns, that will be a turning point for all of humanity, because then it will be too late to make that decision for Christ. But, but even if we're not talking about the turning point for the entire world of humanity today, we might be talking about the turning point for you. Because God may never bring you back to this place where you are right here, right now, where your heart is open to the good news about Jesus, and you're taking this message seriously, and, 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 and you have this, this decision to make today. And I would encourage you, don't put that decision off. Because this may be the turning point for you today. That, that, the, the, that you are exposed to God's wrath on account of your sin, but you have an opportunity to turn from your sin to God and trust in the provision that he's made through the person and work of Jesus Christ. To trust in Jesus as your Savior. And if you haven't done that, stick around after the service today to talk with me about that. Because it's the most important decision decision you'll ever make. And you may never get that opportunity again. You just don't know. Maybe it's not the turning point for the end of the world today, but it might be the turning point for you. And so there are many um, professors who are unprepared, just as in John's day, so now. And many of these professing Christians even today have misplaced confidence. And so that's a big problem. And that's something that we should all be examining ourselves to say, okay, okay, well then, how do I know if my profession is the real thing? How do I know if my profession of faith is true? 
And the answer to that, the solution to that problem, is found in verse 8. It's the same thing today as it was then, to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. That the mark of true repentance is a changed life. The mark of true repentance is a changed life. You see there in verse 8, John exhorts his, 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 the crowds, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And that little phrase, in keeping with, is from one Greek word. It refers, uh, sometimes it's, count, it's translated worthy which isn't the best translation, but I think the um, in keeping with is the idea that, that it gives evidence, evidence that corresponds with reality. And so what John is saying is that you need to be bearing fruit that serves as evidence to say that your profession of repentance corresponds with reality, that it's the real thing. And so your fruit that you're bearing is evidence that you've truly repented, that you truly have faith. And so I think there's some confusion on this idea of repentance because we look at this and think, well, isn't John then proclaiming a message of salvation by works? And he isn't. And that's what I want to unpack a little bit here, because he's talking about the vital role that repentance plays in our relationship with God, both with respect to our salvation and with respect to living the Christian life. And so I want to take a few minutes to unpack that, because I think this is so important. So the mark of repentance is a changed life. And the first thing I think we need to consider is what is repentance? What is repentance? Well, repentance, at its, very, at its most basic level, is turning from sin to God. It's changing your way. It's going a different direction. It's turning from sin to God. Now, there's a lot made in church culture over the last several years of this idea of making Jesus the Lord of your life. And I've never really liked that language. You know why? Because you don't make Jesus the Lord of your life. He is the Lord of your life, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Okay, so, 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 so then this relates to repentance and this idea that, that when we um, turn and acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord, then by virtue of being our creator, then now we recognize his authority over the way that we live our lives. And we recognize that we are accountable to him as Lord for our actions. And this relates to us in our relationship with God in two ways. First of all, with respect to salvation, this is when we recognize that we have a sin problem because we've repented in terms of what we think about Jesus and we realize, okay, I realize now, I wasn't thinking this way before, but Jesus is actually Lord. I'm accountable to him for the choices that I make. I've got a sin problem because I've been going my own way, doing my own thing. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. I have this eternal death penalty and there's nothing I can do about it. And so this repentance becomes a vital part of faith because now that I've acknowledged the Lordship of Christ, I recognize my sin problem. And so I turn to the provision that God has made to deal with that sin problem. The person and work of Jesus through his death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin and having made payment in full on the third day to rise again. And so we trust or place our faith in Jesus to save us. Why? Because we've repented in terms of how we think about Jesus. And we realize he does have authority. I have a sin problem. Jesus came and took care of that sin problem in my place. And so repentance is a vital part of that faith when we come into a saving relationship with God by grace through faith in Jesus. But then this repentance continues on with respect to how we live the Christian life. Because if we we truly, sincerely believe that Jesus is Lord, he has authority over our lives, we are accountable to him, then what's that going to look like? We'll realize, well, salvation isn't just about getting a ticket to heaven when I die. We'll recognize that Jesus actually wants us to live the life that he created us for. That if he's Lord, then we need to be walking in obedience to his commands. And so, um, and so if our profession is sincere, that we recognize Christ's lordship, then we will repent. We will turn from going our way and doing our thing and doing whatever it seems, whatever seems right to me or whatever makes sense to me or whatever feels good to me. And we'll say, no, Jesus is Lord. I've repented. And so now I'm going to go his way and I'm going to seek to discern his will and do his will even when it doesn't necessarily feel good in the moment, even when it doesn't necessarily make sense right here, right now, because he's Lord and he's calling the shots. And that's 
repentance, turning from my way to God's way as we live the Christian life. And so repentance is turning from sin to God. It relates to our decision to place our faith in Christ as our Savior, and it relates to our decision to follow Jesus as our Lord as we live the Christian life. And if that profession of faith and repentance is sincere, then it's going to show up in the way that we live. And that's the point that John is making, is that good works evidence true repentance. Because if we really believe that Jesus is calling the shots, then we should be doing the things that Jesus is telling us to do. Otherwise, it would seem to suggest that we don't actually believe Jesus is the one calling the shots, right? And so, and so good works give evidence of true repentance. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7, verses 18 through 21 and 24. He said, A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a dis diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The same image as John. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, notice a profession, words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So not just a profession, but actually carrying it out, that Jesus is Lord. In verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You know, James in James 2, 17 and 18 has a similar message for us about faith and works. He says, um, so, also by, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, show me your faith by your profession. I'll show you my faith by my life. Which one is going to be more compelling? And so, uh, because actions speak louder than words. And, we, and, and so, the, the, I think the point that Jesus was making with respect to the idea of the, the good tree and the, the good fruit and the bad fruit, he, he's drawing upon this, this idea that, that if we're talking about a tree, say an apple tree, that the, the logical end to that tree's existence is to bear fruit. It's not just to branch out and blossom. Those are a means to an end of producing what? Producing apples. And so, sure, an apple tree isn't going to produce oranges, right? But part of the point that Jesus is making, too, and that John is making, is that apple trees aren't going to produce nothing either. Because that's the logical end of being an apple tree, is to produce something, more specifically, to produce apples. And so... Um, and so if you are truly an apple tree, then you're not going to be producing nothing. You're also not going to be producing oranges. You're producing apples, giving evidence to the fact that that's who you are. And the same could be said for us as a follower of Jesus, that if we really believe that Jesus is Lord, then it's going to show up in doing what Jesus says. And you can look no further than the example of Jesus himself as he lived in obedience to his Father's will. That it wasn't something that he just did because he had to, but because that's who he is. And and that was the life that he came to live. I appreciate how one author put it this way. He said, Jesus didn't seek to do his father's will only from a sense of obligation. There was no drudgery in it. It wasn't a matter of gritting his teeth and getting it done so he could go about his other business. There was no other business. This was his food, his life, his breath, his passion. Doing his father's will was the entire preoccupation of his life. And that's what's going to be true for us as well, as we're being conformed into the likeness of Jesus, that more and more and more is going to show up by us just increasingly doing God's will in our life. And that will be plain and visible, just like apples on an apple tree. And so good works evidence true repentance. Which brings us to the third point then, that we are not saved by works, but we are saved to works. We are not saved by works, but rather to works. The idea that when John is saying in verse 9 that this judgment is coming and he's warning them that if they're not bearing good fruit, then they're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. His idea there isn't a salvation by works, but he's saying, you know what? If there's no evidence that you've truly repented, then you need to be concerned. Because there's at least the possibility that if there's no evidence that you truly repented, that maybe you haven't truly repented. Which means that you're exposed to God's wrath. Not because you're saved by works, but because you haven't actually repented. You haven't turned to the Lord in repentance and faith.
And so, and so we're not saved by works, but rather to works. We see this message being taught in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not, is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Very clear, salvation is not by works. The very next verse, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so we see, no, we're not saved by works, but being saved by grace through faith in Jesus, then we are um, saved to go out and live a new life, to live a life that is characterized by obedience to God's commands, by good works. And why would that be? Because because, because God is conforming us to the likeness of Jesus, restoring that, that image or recreating that image in which he created us to begin with. You see this in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, that we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, that of Christ, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so God's working in our life to restore in a, or recreate the, the, the image of God in us. You see, when we were created in Genesis 1 and 2, we were created in the image of God to reflect his glory to the world around us. Jesus, being the, the perfect image of God as the perfect human being, perfectly reflected God's glory to the world around him through the words that he said, through the life that he lived. And now we're being um, cre recreated in the image of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, that we might be walking obediently with God's commands so that, again, we are... We are reflecting God's glory to the world around us, just like we were created to do. And so that's why when God saves us, it's not just about going to heaven when we die, but it's about fulfilling that purpose for which he created us. That increasingly, through the, the obedience to him, we will be reflecting his glory to the world that he's created just like we were created to do. So no, we're not saved by works, but rather to works. And by the way, even our good works, they're still a product of God's grace. Our good works are still a product of God's grace. We see this in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So even as we are working out the salvation that God has given us, he is working in us to to do his good will. So even these good works to get evidence of our faith, those good works are a product of God's gracious work in our lives. It's not something that we do that, that earns us merit before God, because it's God who's working in us to transform us and change us and give us that desire and that ability to carry out his will to begin with. Uh, but see, that's, that's a promise that God has made, which is why these good works are evidence of true faith. Because when you trust in Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells you. You're submitted to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's going to show up in the way that you live your life. And if it's not showing up in the way that you live your life as a testimony to God's grace, then maybe you haven't experienced God's grace. So, so, so our good works are still a product of God's grace, giving testimony to the work that God is doing within us. So the mark of repentance is a changed life. Turning from sin to God will show up through our good works, giving evidence of true repentance, meaning that we're not saved by works, but we are saved to works, and even those good works are a product of God's gracious work within us. Now, a bit of a warning here for all of us who are, are listening to this this morning, and you might, your mind might be going to people in your life, perhaps family members or friends or neighbors, and you're thinking, boy, they need to be here to listen to this message because I don't think they're bearing fruit. And boy, they, they need to be concerned. And that's a, that's a bit of a problem. Okay, because the, the, the surest and most accurate application of this passage comes with you yourself as you examine yourself to be sure that you are in the faith. Uh, because you see, when it comes down to it, we don't make very good fruit inspectors. We don't make good fruit inspectors when it comes to other people, do we? 
And so, because see, we're fooled by counterfeit fruit, aren't we? Because we see somebody doing something good and, and we don't realize that they're doing it for selfish reasons. They're doing it with the wrong motives. Or we don't see what we're looking for in someone else, but we don't realize that they're bearing fruit in other ways that we aren't personally seeing. And so we're not very good fruit inspectors. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, to those who are challenging his apostleship, he said, therefore, don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. And see, God is uniquely equipped to be a fruit inspector. You know why? Because God actually knows our heart. In fact, in the book of Acts, you see a couple of occasions where the early church, in praying to God, referred to him as the heart knower. It's one word in the Greek text. He's the heart knower. He actually knows our heart. And so he's not going to be fooled by counterfeit fruit, which means that when it comes to our lives, your life and mine, that if we can't even fool our own mother, we're not going to fool God, are we? Because God actually sees and knows what's going on in our heart even better than your mom. That's a scary thought, isn't it? God actually knows. And so while it might be a good idea and warranted to, to perhaps warn somebody that professes to be a Christian, but you don't see any fruit, to have a conversation with them and talk with them about that, that may be warranted and that's fine, but it doesn't do any good to gossip about them and talk behind their back, as I've heard many Christians do, well, I don't even know if that person's a Christian. Well, then that's a conversation you need to have with them, not me. Okay, because because you're sitting there talking about their salvation to me, and I don't have anything to do with their salvation. You need to go talk to them. And what you might be doing there is being a really lousy fruit inspector. And so and so when it comes to a message like this, don't don't immediately start thinking about others. Think about you, and think you know what? Am I really in the faith? Am I bearing fruit that's in keeping with repentance? Because that was the application that the audience in John's day took was to say, okay, then what should we do? Am, 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 I'm not thinking about the guy back in Jerusalem. I'm thinking about me right here, right now. What do I need to do that would give evidence that my profession is real? And so, and, and so that's my warning to us this morning, is to realize that we're not very good fruit inspectors, so make sure that you apply this message to yourself first before you start thinking about others. Because you see, the profession that you're making, the words that you speak certainly matter. And we talked about that in great deal last week, that words really matter. However, our actions validate our words. And so often, actions speak louder than words. And so it's not unlike the, the character Eliza Doolittle in the musical My Fair Lady. Is anybody familiar with that musical? A few. Okay, so My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle. And we're not going to go into all the details, because I think the message of the song that I'm going to cite here will kind of speak for itself. But, but Eliza was upset because she had feelings for a man, Henry Higgins, and those feelings were going unrequited. And so she walked out of Higgins' house, and she was very upset, and there was this guy, Freddie, that, that was head over heels for Eliza Doolittle, and, and she projected all of that anger onto Freddie, poor little Freddie. And, and he was saying all these flowery words to her of how wonderful she was and how much he loved her. And Eliza looked back at him and said, I'm so sick of words. I get words all day through, first from him, now from you. Is that all you blizers can do? Don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Tell me, of, tell me no dreams filled with desire. If you're on fire, show me. Hey, he, he, here we are together in the middle of the night. Don't talk of spring. Just hold me tight. Anyone who's ever been in love will tell you that this is no time for a chat. Haven't your lips longed for my touch? Don't say how much. Show me. And if you've ever been in that kind of relationship with someone, then you realize how big of a problem it is and why this is such a big deal. Because at the end of the day, people can say a lot of things. They can say whatever they want, but too often actions speak louder than words, don't they? And at the end of the day, actions are the surest indicator of what's going on in a person's heart. And so my challenge to you this morning is, to, is that if you are professing to be a follower of Jesus, then live like you've really repented. If you profess to be a follower of Jesus, then live like you've really repented. And that's what John told his audience here in, in, in Luke chapter 3. And what does that look like? Well, first of all, seek to discern God's will. 
Seek to discern God's will. That's what John's audience was doing. And notice that in verses 10 through 14. Three different audiences, the crowds, the tax collectors, the soldiers, every one of them said, what then shall we do? Not what then shall, should they do, but what then shall we do? Seek to discern God's will. How do we do that? We ask that question, what should we do? And we ask that question to God uh, through prayer. We go to the Lord in prayer and say, God, what is it that you want me to do today? There's these situations that I'm dealing with. What is it that you want me to do? We go to God's word where God has revealed his will. And we seek God's help to open our eyes to see these wonderful things in his word that he would have us to do in these various contexts and relationships in our life. We go talk to God's people, Christ, uh, uh, those who can, can speak truth. God's truth into our life and say, this is the situation I'm dealing with. Uh, do you have any insight, any ideas on what I should do here? Because the Holy Spirit works through God's word and he works through God's people and he works in our heart through prayer. And, and so we go to God and sincerely ask, what then should we do? And we know in a, in a general sense, that's going to come back to these ideas of loving God and loving others. But I want you to get specific. I want you to get specific. And especially as it relates to Luke 3, be, be, be focusing especially on possessions and power, because that's where the focus is here in this passage this morning, is to focus especially on the areas of possessions and power. You see there in verse 10, the crowds are talk talking to John saying, what should we do? And he said, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Now when I read that, I think, what's a tunic? I don't know. I mean, what, what's a tunic? And you'll see a picture on the screen. It's, it's from a book, so it's a little blurry, but you can kind of get the idea. The tunic is on the left. The tunic was like underclothing, if you will. It was like a long shirt or a slip, if you will. Um, but it was a long shirt, and you had a belt wrapped around it. It went down to maybe slightly above your knees. Um, it was one of the most basic garments of clothing. You would wear it underneath your robe, like you see here on the right. This is your robe. This guy would be wearing a tunic underneath his robe. And, and so the tunic was one of those basic forms of clothing, like socks and underwear, um, or in the Midwest winters, hats and gloves, right, and coats. And so these are the most basic things um, that, that a person would need in that society, the most basic kind of clothing. And John says, you know what, if you have two of those, and you see somebody else who doesn't have one, then share with them out of your access, out of your excess, because you have more than you need, then share with them to help meet their basic needs. And I think that's a good question for us today, is to ask yourself, can you meet a need with your excess? Is there areas in your life where you've been abundantly blessed by God and you have more than you need? And has God put someone in your life, think about that, has God put someone or people in your life where you can share with them with the excess that God's given to you. Operation Christmas Child is an excellent application of that because it's an opportunity to go out and fill a shoebox with its excess to you, but it's meeting a need and a desire and a special gift for a child. And many of the things that you could put in your shoebox are things that are just bare necessities, needs of life. There's a great example out in the, out in the foyer of the kinds of things you can put in your life. And some of the things are fun toys, but other things are just basic needs. And... And it's a great opportunity to, to, to bless someone else out of the excess that God has given to you. Perhaps there's other relationships that you can think of in your life where that's true, that you could bless somebody out of your excess. Not because you're going to get in trouble if you don't, but because it's the right thing to do, because it expresses the compassion that God has shown to you through the person and work of Jesus. You see, that's fruit that you're actually following the Lord because you're doing it even when you could, go to, even when you could get away without doing it. Um, the, the, or the other area here is, is the area of power. Um, John addressed the tax collectors. And in that day, the tax collectors were authorized to collect the amount of taxes that was required by the government. And then, and then they were authorized to add a, a surcharge onto those taxes for themselves that would help cover personal expenses and turn a little bit of a profit. What they weren't supposed to do was to extort money out of people, which was really easy for them to do because they could to take that surcharge and instead of making it reasonable, they could make it exorbitant. And then if the person wouldn't pay, they would go to Rome and say, uh, they're not paying their taxes. 
And then, bam, the hammer comes down on that person. And there wasn't much recourse that the average person could take when something like that was going on. So again, this was an easy way for tax collectors to make extra money beyond what they were authorized to make. Um, and they could get away with it pretty easily. And Jesus says, you know what? I get it. You can get away with it, but don't go there. Why? Because it's the wrong thing to do. And so, because you are following a God who loves justice, treat others justly. The soldiers were doing similar things. They, they were paid just enough to get by. These are probably Jewish soldiers in the temple. And, and they were paid just enough to get by. But they could go to somebody and say, um, you need to pay me the money or I'm going to drag you in. And, they're, and who are they going to listen to, me or you? Or they could accuse somebody of a crime. And, and in the system in that day, the, the person, if the person was found guilty and they had to pay a fine, whoever brought them in would get a share of that fine. And so again, it was a situation where they could get away with it very easily. But John's saying, no, don't do that because you serve a God who loves justice. Be humble, be content with your wages and, and, and follow the Lord and do the right thing. Not because you can get it, not be, even though you can get away with doing the wrong thing, do the right thing because you're following the Lord and it's the right thing to do. That is fruit that you're truly following Jesus. And so ask yourself that question this morning. Do you have a, 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 are you in a position of power or influence over other people? Perhaps as a parent with your children in your home. Perhaps in the workplace. Perhaps in, um, in the church. Perhaps in other organizations or other relationships that you have. You have a position of influence or power. Don't abuse that position, even if you could get away with it. On the flip side, ask yourself, is there a way that I could use this position of power that God has entrusted to me in order to bless someone else? In the same way that Jesus blessed me with the power and position that he has as a son of God. So think about that. People that, are, that, that you have influence or power over in your life, are there ways that you could bless them in the week ahead with the power that God has entrusted to you? Just like Jesus blessed you with the infinite power and position and authority that belong to him. You see, it reflects the message of Micah 6.8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Because we recognize that God is God. He is a God who loves justice. He is a God who loves mercy. He's reflected that in the person, of work, person and work of Jesus Christ. And we are created and redeemed to reflect that same justice and mercy to others. Even when we can get away with not doing it. Because it's the right thing to do. And we've decided to follow Jesus. And so seek to discern God's will. But then having discerned God's will, remember to do it. Do it. Okay? Uh, Jonathan Edwards put it this way. He said, Godliness consists not in a heart which intends to do the will of God, but in a heart which does it. That's godliness. Not that you intend to do what God wants you to do, but that you actually do it. And so, as you ask yourselves those questions, do I have access with which I could bless someone else? Yeah, I do. And, you know, I'm going to talk with somebody at lunch today about how, boy, that was a great sermon. And, you know, I have areas where I could be blessing other people. That's wonderful. Do that. But then, this week sometime, actually do it. Okay? Don't just talk about it. Actually do it. Ask yourself again, you know, is there a, am I in a position of power where I could be blessing people with this power or this influence in their life? And you talk to other people about it, and that's awesome. Talk to other people about it. But then actually do it. Actually carry it into practice with the grace and the strength and the help that God gives you. Actually do what it is that God wants you to do. Because if all you do is talk about it, you haven't borne any fruit. The fruit is in the doing, in doing what it is that God wants you to do. So as we've seen in this message this morning, there, in John's day, just as today, um, there, there were some people who were professing to have repented. There were people who were professing to be in a right relationship with God. But as we saw, some professors are unprepared. And the way that we can know if our profession is the real thing is by looking at our lives. Because the mark of repentance, of true repentance, 
repentance is a changed life. So are you a follower of Jesus? Are you professing to be a follower of Jesus? Then live like you've really repented and bear fruit, knowing that it is God himself who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word that you've given us today. And God, help us to examine ourselves. Help us to resist the temptation to think about everybody else that we could possibly be thinking of right now. And help us to pause and think about how this message applies to my life individually. And help us to be honest with ourselves, Lord. We might be able to fool other people. Sometimes we're even pretty good at fooling ourselves. But Lord, you are the heart knower. We're never going to fool you. So God, help us to examine our hearts to see if there is fruit, evidence that you are at work in our lives just as you promised to do if we've repented and turned to Christ in faith for salvation. And Lord, help us to be humble enough to recognize that if there isn't any fruit, then maybe we haven't really turned Maybe we're still going our own way and doing our own thing. We've never really come to terms with who Jesus is. And we've never really trusted in him for the salvation that he came to bring. Please don't let pride get in the way. So Lord, um, be at work in our hearts today and in the week ahead that as we consider these opportunities that you've given us through possessions and power, Lord, help us to use the possessions and power that you've entrusted to us. Certainly not to abuse others, but to bless them that they might see your glory reflected in us and in this church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.